Hoo ha too ha! Hello and welcome to episode 7 of Happy Harry's Who Ha To How To's or Ha Ha To Ha 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 To Ha Ha for short. I'm Harry Partridge and today we're going to be looking at colour and working with colour and putting colour into your animation. Now colour is absolutely hugely important in pretty much every visual medium from macaroni pictures to glass blowing and animation is absolutely no exception so without any further ado um, and even though I love ado we're gonna jump right in and look at the color wheel now this possibly very familiar site is the color wheel kind of a big rainbow colored pie chart or um, a big gay pie if you will and you've probably seen it before if you've ever taken an art class or um, maybe uh, sort of like one of those spinny devices that you get with a board game. It kind of looks like one of those. Anyway, um, I don't consider this to be hugely important to show you the different colours that you have to work with. I'm assuming you know what colours there are in existence, and of course this is not all of them. Um, this is only kind of a segmented, boiled down representation of which colours we have. Um, Instead, I think it's kind of nice to look at colours in relationship to one another. So, for example, later on I'll probably hit upon talking about hot colours and cold colours. And as you can see, sort of this section here, which comprises of the reds and orange and sort of peach through to yellow, are the hotter uh, end of the spectrum. And then if I talk about cool colours, that sort of comprises um, purple and blue and maybe a little bit of green as well. And also something very interesting that we can look at, which I'll come to in a moment, is the uh, idea of complementary colours and the relationship that one colour has with the colour on the other side of the colour wheel. For example, here we have yellow and purple and by drawing a line through the colour wheel we can see uh, what would be kind of be the opposite colour um, that in many ways is considered to be a complementary colour and I'll, I'll show you that in effect in just a moment. Now one other thing that I'd like to talk about is of course when dealing with colour, we're not only going to be picking our shade, but also the level of uh, saturation and the brightness of the colour. And if you're working digitally like I am, it's very easy to select uh, how you want to change those aspects. So now if I grab the yellow here and go to my bucket fill tool, I can bring up here the uh, option to actually change my yellow to a lighter white or through to a black and of course anywhere in the middle but on top of that I can also change the level of vibrancy and the level of saturation that yellow has by dragging my slider here in flash up and down can actually move the yellow from a very very vibrant and strong yellow down through to a grey and that isn't affecting the brightness of the color that's instead affecting the saturation now by some devilish cloning method, I've created three of the exact same grey, generic, boring looking superhero. And we're going to give our superhero some colour, but we're going to do it hopefully in a kind of clever thinking way. Now by going back to the colour wheel and selecting, I don't know, uh, the blue, we can go back and begin to drop the colour in on our hero. But we're going to select another costume colour for him, and by going back to the colour wheel we can pick the opposite end of the wheel or the opposite side of the wheel which will in theory be the complementary color now that doesn't mean that necessarily these colors go well together but what they do is by being on the opposite side of the color wheel they are so different from each other they're as different in fact as they can be they do help to emphasize one another and um, show each other off as best as possible now that might not be for you but again, it's it's a nice way of thinking about one colour in relationship to another and how that can change the end result. Let's do something else here. Let's take the red, for example, and drop that in. We're kind of making Captain Canada here. He'll hold the door open for you and mispronounce boat. Uh, now if we go back to our colour wheel, on the other side of that red is the green. 
Doesn't have to be green though, we could go for a yellow, so maybe we should do that. Which is not quite the true complementary colour, but they're different enough still that we both get kind of a similar effect. Which is pretty good. Although just to show you that you don't have to always pick a complementary colour, let's go for, I don't know, maybe this purple. Which looks pretty good. And something else. And I'm going to say, hey, maybe we should just go with... That grey actually by itself looks pretty good. I can kind of make our background darker. And yeah, not a bad looking trio of costumed heroes. Now arguably something that is a lot more important than just picking striking colour combinations for your characters and something that is arguably a lot more fun as well is the task of assigning colour combinations to um, not just characters but locations and every part of your film that actually helps to drive the narrative forward. And here I've created four characters completely at random and I'm going to give them the beginnings of a colour scheme that I think actually helps to sell who they are to the audience. So with our first character here we have this sort of larger than life party girl. Uh, I'm thinking she's very loud, very attention grabby, um, and all around sort of big and larger than life. So what I want to do is give her a colour that represents that. And I'm thinking of a really saturated deep red for the dress. Dark but still very vibrant and very loud. And I'm also going to give her a hair colour now. And I'm thinking that by picking a colour that is sort of visually close to red on the colour wheel, such as a kind of very vibrant deep orange, will create a sort of visual cacophony. Um, the colours clash slightly, but um, she clashes as a person. She's big, she's sort of in your face and confrontational. And I think that by creating that visual cacophony, we can help to sell that literal noise that she makes as she comes running through the house. She kind of looks a little bit like Miss Bellum from the Powerpuff Girls Gone Horribly to Seed. Okay, so on with the next character. Here we have a very uh, reclusive, frightened loner character. Kind of a Woody Allen type. I'm thinking he's very neurotic. And to sell him, I think we're going to design a colour that um, is very sort of drab and the opposite of the party animal that we've just designed. I think he needs something that says that he's um, shy um, and uh, retiring and doesn't want any kind of confrontation. So maybe maybe a very muted blue and by sort of graying that blue out and dragging it down and making it dark we create a sort of drab colour that I think matches who he is. And we'll also want to give him, I think, a shoe or boot colour. But I don't think that he's going to want anything that uh, grabs too much attention. So really, it's going to be that original colour made just a little bit darker for his shoes. And I think that says quite a lot about him. Now, third on the list, we have this sort of stinky little girl. And that's, this is actually kind of raised as an interesting point. Sometimes you'll have a character, for example, <laughs> a person who smells, and you can get that across by maybe giving them brown or green clothes or something that looks putrid. And I, I'd call that more sort of functional character design or functional color design. For example, if you want uh, a cop in your story that it has to look like a cop, it has to appear to be a cop, they're only on the screen for a few seconds, better put them in blue. Um, but in this case, we have a character who's a little girl that I think is... Um, maybe a bit of a tomboy, likes to roll in the mud, sets fire to her toys and buries them rather than plays with them. So I'm going to give her, I think, a purple. Because that sort of takes the pink that is so often associated with little girls, but maybe twists it a little, makes it a little darker, a little more grim. Make it slightly dark, slightly desaturated. And I think that, to me, says odd little girl. Looks a lot like me when I was a little girl, actually. And finally, for our last character, um, we have a, 
Again, he's proud and he's confident, but I think unlike the party girl, he's a little bit more reserved and smug. This is the sort of guy that if he got a dent on his car would probably break his apparently cool demeanor and absolutely freak out. So I think by showing that he's so prissy and um, so proud, maybe a really sharp white, but uh, actually I'm going to go with a sort of ice blue, which in some ways is even more white than white and give him an all ice blue suit. Okay, so even without having all of their own skin and hair colours, we have four pretty distinct looking characters, at least from a colour perspective, and that can really help when you're designing the colour for the world of your cartoon. Now, even if you have four characters that are very similar, let's say we had four wild, in-your-face party animals, a lot like the lady here, well, even then, I think you'd have to find different ways to visually represent them and definitely give them different color schemes because if you do give everyone a very similar looking color palette, you can run into problems. And I kind of have an example here. The Real Ghostbusters is one of my all-time favorite cartoon series and I'm a huge fan of the films on which the series is based. But if you remember, the characters in the film actually had a very consistent look to them. They all had the same color uniforms, um, three of the four characters had the same skin and hair color, and they all looked pretty samey. Now when the show was adapted into an animated series, or sorry, the film rather, was adapted into an animated series, they changed the visuals of the characters a whole lot. Uh, Peter Venkman pretty much stayed the same, but Egon Spengler got a sort of light blue uniform, if I remember correctly. And I've made no attempt here at drawing them anything like they appeared in the show. Please forgive me for that. And... Egon actually had a sort of platinum blonde hairdo, which is wildly out of character, but whatever, it seemed to stick and kind of worked for the character in the end. And Ray was given a sort of light tan colour suit and oddly ginger hair that, again, fitted his character. Now that may seem sacrilegious to fans of the film that they changed the character's appearance so much, but it really helped the characters all read and it was much easier for people to follow the story and tell which character was saying what and doing what, especially from a distance. Now imagine you've got those same four brown Ghostbusters shrunk down to be absolutely tiny on the screen. That could cause real problems for being able to read who's who, but when the characters all have radically different colour schemes from one another, that's no longer a problem. Another hugely important thing to consider when designing the colours of your world and your characters is how characters end up fitting into their backgrounds and sort of the silhouettes that they end up cutting. Now for example, I've got this sort of generic looking space superhero here. Yeah, I admit I'm not going to end up working for Marvel anytime soon, but whatever. He kind of serves a function, and he's flying through space, and he looks pretty cool. And here, we have this goofy-looking football kid. Yeah. And uh, I'm not particularly proud of him. Now, the characters by themselves are okay, they're generic, but whatever, they, they do what they're supposed to. But if we put them in the settings that they were originally designed for, you can see how huge problems will arise. Uh-oh! Our space superhero, who's dressed entirely in black, doesn't stand out at all in his space background. So if, you know, 90% of the story is him flying through space, we'd need to do a pretty serious redesign for his costume to help him cut that silhouette. In fact, having a character that's all white would would suit this far better. God, I sound like Michael Richards. <laughs> having a character who's dressed in white would suit this scenario far better. Now, if we have Ball Boy here playing with his balls, Imposed on a blue and green background when he's wearing a blue shirt and green trousers or green trunks Again, he's cutting a pretty lame silhouette against that backdrop and that's a huge problem It would be far better to pick I don't know perhaps the uh, Complementary colors for the background that he's on so given that it's a blue maybe we could put him in Possibly some sort of red shirt. It's not exactly complementary, but it fits far better and stands out far more and maybe against the green background, something like an orange would look pretty good. He's clashing a little bit, but he fits now so much better and actually pops out so much better from his background. 
Now, just while we're on the subject of backgrounds, I will get to backgrounds again in a future episode, and we'll talk about the color principles of dealing specifically with backgrounds. Right now, I'm going to concentrate on characters because there's still a lot to cover. Uh, especially with this little guy coming up who's got a problem with oversaturation. Be ready to avert thine eyes. Ugh, here we go. Um, this little dude here is a kind of generic happy bug character that I've made. And uh, every color in his palette, even though he doesn't have that many colors, they're all pumped up. They're all pumped up to over 11, if you get that reference. They are way too bright, way too vibrant, way too oversaturated, and it's ugly. Um, it's too busy. If the character has that much saturation, then there's really nothing to um, sort of break up his form and nothing really draws your eye. Here's the same character again, pretty much using the same colors, but they're all muted a lot more and he seems a lot more in control. And there's no reason that if you have a character like this, you can't add maybe a few oversaturated areas. For example, we could get the uh, color from his uh, oversaturated version's nose and antennas, and that kind of gives him a more uh, balanced look, even though we've added some saturation back in. But as a general rule, I think err on the side of caution and, and don't bombard people with too much color unless you really know what you're doing. Luckily, he has quite a limited palette, and let me show you what happens when you don't keep control of your palette. Okay, here I've got a kind of funky go-go girl uh, with a little Walkman, if you remember what those things are. And she's dancing and she's having fun. And I've given her a color scheme here on the next frame, but there's a problem with it. Bam, there we go. Now, unfortunately, she's got almost every color under the sun on her body. She's got little blue braces, blonde hair, the red um, headphones, green headband. She's got pinks, blues, orange, whites, dark greens, sort of pale reds and, and sort of royal blues. And she's far, far too busy looking. The problem is, even if the colors are complementary, or even if they're sort of fun and vibrant together, there is too much information here, and the character doesn't sort of have any consistency to it. Um, instead here, I have an alternative version of the character using really only two colors, beyond her fairly neutral skin tone, and maybe the uh, gray of the Walkman buttons and the white of her socks and teeth. She's effectively only using pink and yellow. And I've kind of played with each of those colors and created uh, brighter and sort of lighter tones. There's a sort of pale pink, there's a, a sort of dark pink or borderline purple on her shoes. And then the yellow we've sort of darkened up to create an orange, but they're still very close together. Um, if not on the color wheel, they're still sort of more darker or less saturated versions of that same color. And I think that she has a lot more sort of consistency to her and a lot more appeal in her design than a character as busy as this. Now before I wrap things up, I'd like to talk a little bit about a character's color palette and how that can alter based on lighting or mood or setting or all those other things so here we have a character who is up in the middle of the night, maybe he's heard a strange noise and he's got up to investigate, but he looks very flat. In fact, it looks like he's probably stood out in the middle of a field uh, in the middle of the day, which is not going to be the case. By simply adding some dark shadows to him, we get the impression now that he's being at least lit by the camera. Camera? Fuck me, I'm tired. Candle! <laughs> the candle is sort of emanating all this bright light and uh, it's creating these darker areas to the side of the character. And all we've done there is swatch the original color, create a darker, slightly desaturated version of it, and by adding in that color we create a pretty effective looking shadow. But still, it doesn't have quite the mood of a character up in the middle of the night, and we can create that by working in cooler, um, more sort of blue tones. So here is the same character again, but we've worked in shadows that have a more muted gray-blue sort of 
uh, hue to them. And this way the character doesn't look like he's stood in the middle of a field anymore, but we can imagine the character in a big long corridor with uh, dark windows with sort of blue moonlight pouring through. Here again is the character with blue shadows, but this time all of the shadows are the exact same kind of blue. And it's just an alternative colouring method that I've seen used before quite effectively, but I honestly prefer the uh, slightly different shades of blue depending on which part of the body is being shaded in and coloured. Here we have the same character again, this time his realistic set of colours has been replaced with a new kind of context sensitive palette of blues and greys and muted cold feeling colours and even without a background we still get the impression that the character is in a cold place but let's take him out of that cold place and put him somewhere with a background Hey, how about here? Uh, it's certainly a lot warmer. What is he doing in hell? I don't know. I'm just trying to make a point about how you can create atmosphere and tone by just changing the colours of your work. And uh, I don't know. Maybe he made candle wax out of school children or something. That's disgusting. I'm really sorry. Anyway, that's all for me this week. I'm going to be back next week with a brand new episode. So uh, I'll catch you then. Take care. Bye bye.